ahead of the um, comments and questions. And um, so I am, I am really pleased to give the floor to our second speaker uh, for this uh, webinar today, which is uh, Alice Chota. And um, she is um, Alice Chota is the Communications and Knowledge Exchange Manager for the REACH program, an FCBO founded research program led by the University of Oxford to improve water security for 10 million people affected by poverty in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. She is also a documentary photographer using photography as a tool to communicate environmental, water and climate research. So today, Alice will guide us in reflecting on what can participatory photography and bottom-up approaches teach us about water. So Alice, thank you very much for being with us today. And the floor is uh, yours. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, thanks for, uh, to everyone for joining. So let me just share my screen. I'll set it up now. Um, <clears throat> there we go. Can you see this well? Yes. I'll just go in full screen. Can you see this? Perfect, yes. Great, so um, as Sarah um, kindly introduced, my name is Alice Chotard, um, and today I'll be sharing with you my experience using photography for research, for, communi for communication, as well as community engagement around, uh, around water. And my background is maybe a little bit different from uh, some of the other speakers on the series. I'm not a researcher myself, but I have... Um, I'm working at the interface of research and communication, and I have a, a foot, I think, in, in both worlds. Um, currently, as Sarah mentioned, I'm the communications and knowledge exchange manager for the REACH program. Um, and as she explained, REACH is led by the University of Oxford, and we're working in, in East Africa um, and um, in South Asia. Um, my background is actually in water science and policy. I have a master's from uh, Oxford in uh, water science policy and management. And my role since that master's have included a, a um, combination of research and communications role. Um, and I'm also a, a, a photographer who's very keenly interested in using photography to specifically communicate um, research to various um, audiences. So just, just to wrap up, to explain what drives my work, what drives my, what are my interests? Um, well, firstly, you know, what, what can we learn from local communities about the crucial role water plays, uh, and especially in a climate change uh, context? Um, and in general, my view is that the science is, is really critical to generate knowledge and to push for change. But I think it's very important that we're able to communicate that research and, and we know we need to meet people uh, where they are at. And uh, facts and science on its own isn't enough often to, uh, to be able to communicate to those audiences. And interestingly enough, when we think about uh, water, uh, the primary medium through which uh, researchers and especially social scientists uh, interact with water is through writing and reading. Um, but actually, you know, wider audiences, the general public, also interact with water a lot, but through their own senses, through their sight, their smell, their touch, the feel. And, and so I think it's very important that we try to diversify the type of media we use to engage audiences, because we know that uh, stories, visuals, uh, sounds um, are much more powerful at communicating uh, key messages. And our brain not only understands faster, but it also remembers faster. So that's one aspect that really drives, um, oops, if, uh, hold on a minute. Yes, my presentation is back. Uh, that really drives some of my work. And finally, I think the last point relates more to the ethics of photography, something that I'll be talking about in my presentation is how we can ensure that people's experiences, stories and their realities are accurately um, and ethically 
captured, represented and shared. And that ties back to both the, the research and the communication aspect. So I'll try to cover these different elements in my presentations today by sharing a few projects that I've been working on um, over the past few years. And so the first project is called Himalayas to Ocean um, or H2O. It's a project I set up in, in 2017 to document the, the impacts that climate change is having on, on water and therefore on people, on water security um, in Nepal in particular. And uh, using multimedia tools, including photography, video, um, sound recording, and very much based on, on interviews. So um, we were a small team, including a videographer um, and uh, a sound engineer, um, as well as a storyteller. Um, 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 yes, and we partnered with the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford and the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, um, ECMOD, to um, very much communicate the research. The, the idea was that this was a project that was led by the research using interviews and then using multimedia outputs as a communication tool. And I think the, the main aim of the project was to document the, the diversity of ways in which climate change is affecting water and how people use water, how people interact with water and the impact that that's having in people's daily lives. There's often the assumption that um, <clears throat> climate change um, will just have an impact on the melting of glaciers uh, in, in the region, in the Himalayas, but actually there's so many other ways that it's affecting um, people's um, uh, use um, of water, you know, through floods and droughts and, and a number of other, uh, other ways. And we, we're also showing how those impacts change geographically. They also change based on uh, people's socioeconomic status. So exploring those ideas, uh, but very much uh, grounded in the science and collecting interviews along the way. Um, so conceptually, the project followed the Gandaki River uh, that runs in Nepal from the Himalayas, so close to the border with Tibet, all the way down to the border with, uh, with, um, with India. Um, and with ECMOD, so the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, we chose four specific areas where we spent more time in and collected interviews. And those areas collected with different types of uh, impacts, in a sense. So the first one is located in Mustang in the Himalayan region, close to the border with Tibet. Then we move to the mid hills of Nepal, um, then to the, to the um, lower foothills and finally to the floodplains um, of Nepal. And what I want to do now is to just take you through a few of these images. Um, obviously, images weren't the only output. We also had videos and sound recording. Um, but I just want to give you a flavor of some of the issues that we captured. So this is an image that was taken um, in the in the Himalayas. Um, and unfortunately, we know that uh, that um, the climate is changing in, in the climate is changing in mountain, that it's warming. And a recent report by ECMOD found that uh, warming has doubled in the Himalayan region over the last decade. And for me, why this image is striking is, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but at the back here, you can see Annapurna um, Mountain. That's at over 8,000 meters in altitude. And this is, um, this is the Nilgiri North um, mountain. And this is at over 7,000 in altitude. And I remember just being fa fa facing these mountains and thinking how little snow there was left on these peaks. Um, and what we asked through this project was, what does it mean really for people who live there, who depend on the snow melts and how do they depend on them? What impact is that change in, in water access uh, going to have? And one of the main impacts and one of the most striking ways we found um, that glacial melt is, is having an impact on people is actually through apple production. Apple in this region has been a very productive crops, especially in, uh, in recent decades since it was introduced in the region. Um, and this is a woman called Marfa, uh, sorry, a woman called Kamala in a village um, called Marfa. She's been growing apples for, for decades now and she makes various pro products and she sells them in her local guest house. 
and what she's been what she's told us is that the the snow is really critical to keep the soil um, irrigated, especially during the dry season. Um, Mustang in, in this part of the Himalayas is extremely dry. So it's very critical, especially during um, the summer month. Um, yeah, especially during the spring that they have um, that the soils keep irrigated. And what she's been observing is a decrease in the quantity and in the quality of apples. And this correlates with um, a lot of the interviews that we led in, in, this, um, in this area. Um, and people think it's due to the fact that there is less snow. They observe um, less snow on, on um, or the snow stays for, for less long periods of time. Um, interestingly enough, further down the valley where it's a little bit warmer, um, apples have disappeared entirely, whereas they used to be extremely productive. So the weather there is warmer. This is an image that highlights one of the last, it's a very iconic photo, it's one of the last standing dead apple trees um, in the village. And now they're having to grow corn um, as well as other crops that are less productive. And so what we see is really a shift in apple production. It's moving higher up in the valley where the temperatures are, um, are, are less warm. So the snow is able to stay on, on the ground and keep the soils irrigated. Um, and this also highlights that, um, uh, you know, there will be losers and some some winners, winners, I guess, to some extent. Some people are able to adapt. Some people are less able to adapt. It really highlights the differences in in people's um, socioeconomic status and background, etc. Their networks, um, etc. This is another iconic photo um, highlighting Neil Green North. So this peak that I showed in, a, in an earlier photo. Um, and it's iconic because a lot of the people we interviewed were pointing at it and telling us that um, the, the mountain used to be covered in snow, um, but now they can increasingly see the, the black of the mountain, as you can see, you know, this, this kind of dark color, the, the lack of, of snow. So now moving on to the mid hills um, of Nepal, we document issues of, um, of landslide and landslides are uh, quite a, a common type of, of disaster uh, in Nepal. Uh, it accounts for about 30% of, of casualties and we know that um, uh, one of the things that causes or accelerates landslides is extreme rainfall. And with climate change, it's predicted that um, there will be more erratic and intense rainfall. And this is very much something that echoed, um, it, that we heard in the interviews that we led in the area. But so what does it mean for, for the community here? Well, actually, there used to be, um, this is... Um, this is Daddy Ram, um, one of the locals that we interviewed, and he walked us through this, this massive landslide. I mean, when we talk about landslide, it's not just a little encroachment in a mountain, it's a whole area of a mountain um, that, is, that is completely disappearing. This is on the other side of the mountain, um, and there actually used to be a village on, on this side of the mountain, but the village has uh, been completely destroyed. And so people have been forced to relocate uh, further downstream. Um, so that's one impact of the landslide is just the, the, the sheer destruction of, of um, houses, lives and livelihoods. But another impact is um, flooding, actually, uh, with all these sediments coming down, they accumulate further down and um, they accumulate in a riverbed that's located further downstream. And so when it rains a lot because of the sediments that creates flooding. So now that village where people have been re relocated is threatened by flooding issues. So they're in a sense, they're being caught between landslides and, and flooding issues. Um, I'm going quite quickly, but the third uh, location is in the lower foothills of Nepal. Um, so you can see the landscape changes a lot. It's much more humid, it's much greener, much more lush. And we spent some time in a, an in indigenous village called Dolunga. And here the focus was very much on women, uh, the nexus between women, water and climate change. And interestingly enough in, in Nepal, a lot of the men move abroad to work. So it's estimated that about 10%, one in 10% 10, um, 10 of men um, migrate overseas. And it's one of the countries with the highest um, 
proportion of uh, remittances from abroad. And so a lot of the responsible, the, well, the responsibilities for household uh, water use um, is is the woman's role, and, and that's quite common across uh, across the world. Um, but um, but what we also find is that women are responsible for a lot of the other tasks, such as agriculture, etc., because there's um, not many men around, and uh, it's a very difficult. Uh, landscape. This is the top of the village. This is the village here, but they have to travel um, daily three, four hours to access their crops that are located near the river further down. So it's it's a very heavy burden. And with climate change, it's making water access more difficult. Um, it's also having an impact on uh, which types of crops they can grow. This is a woman uh, that we interviewed um, who she's actually one of the ones who told us about the long distances that they, they're having to, to walk. Um, and she's starting now to grow different types of crops um, to adapt to the changing to the changing climate thanks to um, a, a local um, NGO that's been working with them. And finally, moving down to the floodplains of Nepal. So if 85% of Nepal is, uh, is, is covered by mountains, uh, the floodplains of Nepal are completely flat and they're often prone to flooding issues. Um, but uh, one month before we were there, Nepal was, or that whole region of Nepal was completely underwater because Nepal faced one of the worst um, one of the worst flooding events in 15 years. It affected 2 million people in Nepal and 500,000 people were, were displaced. This, this is actually near a national park which um, hosts rhinos and some of the rhinos were um, were brought um, hundreds of kilometers further downstream in India because of those floods that affected both uh, Nepal and India. And so here we led interviews um, with local communities about the impacts of, of floods and, and how they were adapting. This is uh, um, in an area right by the bank of the river where people were living in tents. And this is a house that was a temporary house that was rebuilt um, where we interviewed um, a woman called Keshari, who's um, she's a widow and a mother of four. And she literally lost everything in, in those floods. She lost her goats and her chicken. And the, she said the rice was ready to be harvested, but she lost her whole, the whole harvest. Um, and something that I, I remember her saying also is that um, she knows that um, floods like this will happen over and over again, but she has nowhere to go because she um, has no assets, she has very few connections. And it, it again, it highlights the idea that different people are able to um, adapt differently to those changes uh, due to climate change and, and, and the impact on, uh, on their water security. So this is, in a nutshell, this is um, those kind of three, those four areas that we covered. Um, this is an image of the sound engineer, uh, Nico, in, uh, this is in the Himalayan region. You can see how dry it is, uh, but he's actually using a microphone that records sound in 360, it's called surround sound. So we've been able to do a lot of, um, a lot of out outputs out of this, combining photography and, and, and sound, and we also had a, a videographer. So there's lots of different types of outputs we've made some short videos. We also, uh, well, we did a train, we've done trainings with environmentalists. Um, <clears throat> we um, organized immersive multimedia surround sound exhibitions combining, um, so sound in 360, um, which combined field recordings and interviews as well as images and, and video. Um, that was also presented at international conferences and we had online publications. We did a musical collaboration, which some of you may um, have heard about. Um, it was featured in one of the When Water Speaks, uh, When Waters Speak webinar hosted by the Global Network of Water Museums. And this was a collaboration with the Orchestra of St. John um, and the band Peck. And it combined, it was the, the way the music was composed was very much based on um, the, the exhibition, the research from the work. And it combined also some uh, field recordings from, from, um, from the project. 
and we've done a number of events, webinars, and public engagement. So, <clears throat> what are some of the learnings from this uh, from this project? So, well, one is that there is a real scope for these kinds of research artistic collaborations, um, and this this probably also highlights uh, what Valentina thinks. I think they, there is. Um, from the researchers and there's a real appetite to be better able at um, taking the research outside of academia and from an art from the artistic perspective um, I think there is a real need to uh, work more closely with scientists so that the the art can be used in a purposeful way especially in the current context where there are so many changes uh, climate change and 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 various other um, various other pressures. Um, in terms of the multimedia, the, the content itself, we found there's a huge demand for this kind of collaborative multimedia con content that blends photography and film and audio. And one of the reasons is that it can be reused in so many purposes. It's not just an image on a wall, but it's it can be um, much more interactive with an audience, it can be um, featured online uh, in various events and there's so much you can do and I think this is quite a, an interesting reflection especially in the age of Covid where um, uh, people have been engaging less in physical spaces but there are actually many opportunities to present um, content in different ways. And then the final point is around um, the difficulty to measure tangible impacts of these kinds of communications project. And I think probably maybe this is something that some of you can relate. How do we know whether um, uh, whether these communication activities lead to uh, greater knowledge, whether they actually empower people to do something about it? Uh, what is it actually contributing? Um, I think this is something that is always on the back of my mind. So I want to then move on to a very different part of the world, um, Ethiopia, where um, I've also been working as part of the REACH program. Um, so yes, so Ethiopia is very much at the, the, the heart of um, water security and, and climate change issues. Um, and I, I traveled in 2018 with a colleague of mine called Dr. Catherine Gresham, who's on the REACH program. And uh, we wanted to use images to document um, her research around the various ways in which, well, around the, the multifaceted value of water in this very um, water insecure context, and also how climate change is exacerbating these issues. And just for a little bit of context, uh, there's a recent report by UNICEF and uh, the WHO called the Joint Monitoring Program, and they found that um, in Ethiopia only 5% of the population has access to safely managed water, whereas that's about 40% in urban areas. So there's a real there's a real um, discrepancy between um, water um, in, in rural areas and, and water in urban areas. But what we wanted to show is that even in, uh, in, in rural areas, there's a lot of diversity of issues that, um, that people face. Um, so we spent some time, this is actually Catherine's research site where she's been spending um, a lot of time doing research. Uh, this is it's called Fentale. So this is Ethiopia. Um, this is the Fentale district, and this is a zoom of the Fentale district. And the three areas where we led interviews and uh, took images. Harukersa is a very dry landscape with difficult water supply and difficult access to water. Metehara is actually a, a town, a small town, located near a lake. This is called Lake Baseka. And uh, finally, this is another rural sub-district called Gola, which faces um, issues of both drought and, and flooding. Um, and very briefly, again, I want to take you through some, uh, some of the images. Um, this is... This, these are young girls uh, fetching water and we know again that in many parts of the world girls are responsible for um, for fetching water. This is Harukersa, so again you can see that how 
heritage the landscape is there is a water supply in the village but it's often um failing and and people have to pay to to access the water so they often go to the river but in the dry season uh, when it doesn't rain it can be a 10 hour round trip so this has an impact on um on on people's lives and and education for children um, we often see photos of girls and women when it comes to water, but actually boys also have a responsibility in this area. They're often the ones having to take care of the cattle to take them for, for drinking. Obviously, the water quality requirements are less so than for um, uh, human drinking. But again, they, they will be affected by um, the lack of rain. Um, and, uh, and this will have an impact on, on education as well. So this is in the Gola sub-district, um, which is the one that is affected by floods and droughts. And it looks very arid here, but actually a few months prior is completely, his field was completely underwater because of floods. Um, and so Mohammed, this the, 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 the man, who, the farmer who is standing here was telling us his challenges with, um, with coping with the, the 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 changes between floods and drought and especially uh with the the more um erratic rainfall that he's been observing in in recent uh, in the recent decade in the past decade and finally this is an image um from lake baseca so right next to the town of metahara and the reason why i want to show it is because it's a it's a lake that has been expanding not because of rain but because of geological uh, features and also um, overflow from, from irrigation. But it's a, a lake that's highly saline and it's been encroaching on the town's water supply, causing, um, causing water access issues, but also water quality issues. Um, so in a sense, the aim here is to show that even in a small area, there are just such a diversity of, of um, of water issues and the learnings here are similar to uh, the previous project in terms of the you know the use of photography and multimedia content I, so i also recorded some sounds and some interviews and used them for outputs and exhibitions etc um but i think there's something else for me that was very um important working on this project it was it's more it's a reflection more around the ethics of photography and whose perspective um we are representing obviously i i felt like i was coming in as an ex external person uh, a foreigner um who's not from that area and um the the interaction we had with uh, with the local community was well we were very much open to hearing their stories but even though it was interview led i was still the one holding the camera um and taking the images pointing at what i felt represented um their their own stories their own interviews and obviously um those images were influenced by my own understanding of what uh, constitutes a beautiful image uh, an effective image and that's not necessarily necessarily um actually how those people um would have represented themselves and oftentimes what we find in sort of western photography and hum especially humanitarian and development photography is that people tend to be portrayed as victims and i found myself looking back at my images um and, and i found those images quite static so for example if we look at this image this is an, an image of mohammed in front of his field it doesn't really tell much about the, the difficult choices he's had to make um, it, it really por just portrays him as a, as a victim. And I think this narrative um, sometimes legitimizes um, externals and foreigners coming in, bringing in their own solution rather than really trying to un understand the local knowledge and working with the local knowledge, the local solutions. So there were a lot of questions that arose from, from this project. Um, and what Catherine and I decided to do was to lead a participatory photography project in the same area as a follow-up to understand um, whether images would be different would they look different if they were taken by the community um, the community members itself um, so just before i move on to that project that participatory photography project i just want to share three reflections about 
uh, why photography, three elements of photography ethics that I think are really important to consider. One is around the community um, engagement. So how we interact as photographers, as foreigners with the communities we photograph. Um, there's a, an element of the informed consent. So um, making sure that we explain why we here, who we are, what we're doing, how um, the images will be used, where they will be displayed, but also the the approach that we have with people. We have to remain curious um, and and um, and respectful. I think that's a really important aspect of um, taking images. The second is around representation and and really. Um, feeds back to what I was talking about earlier is how we represent the communities that we photograph. Um, how is that representation informed? And is this how people want to be represented? Is that is it how they would like to be represented? Is it how they see themselves? And finally is a point on interpretation. And that's very much how the viewer and or the audience understands the issues captured in those images and we know that we all we all have a bias um our own worldview that will shape how we understand what we see um, and so i think it's very important um, as photographers as curators to be very explicit about um about what images show and 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 how um <clears throat> So now moving on to uh, participatory photography. Um, so as I say, we decided to do a, a, a follow up project in the same area in, in Fentale using participatory photography training uh, some of the community members to take their own um, to take their own images uh and then select them um and then uh, display them so we specifically you've heard already about participatory approaches but we used a method called photo voice uh, where community members are involved in taking images of um of their own experiences the challenges they face and then feed those back to decision makers so it's not just about knowledge generation for research it is also an, an element of presenting it back to um decision makers and uh, i guess some of the questions we asked were uh, from a photography perspective would this generate a different kind of uh, a different kind of Im of image would this be an effective way of communicating some of the um local challenges some of the local uh, issues for research but also to decision makers and then last but not least um, how does the how does this experience how does this influence the experience of the photographers can this be um a, an empowerment tool actually rather than uh the the people being just uh, subjects of a photograph they're actively taking part so we recruited um, an Ethiopian humanitarian photographer called Martha Tedese. You can see her in this image. She's training here some of the uh, participants. Um, we unfortunately, this was at the height of the pandemic. So even though we had planned to uh, to go back um, at this moment, we unfortunately couldn't because of travel restrictions. Um, but uh, so on the ground, we had Martha Tadese, who is absolutely fantastic. She had experience. She's a photographer, a humanitarian photographer, and she had experience working with participatory photography projects before. We also worked with a local uh, field uh, assistant, field researcher with whom we'd worked before, who was also originally from that community. So he knew the community um, very well. Um, so there were 12 participants, six women and six men. They were trained to uh, capture images. We asked them to take three kinds of images. One was um, <clears throat> images of how they used water in their daily lives. The second was some of the water uh, challenges they faced. And then third was around how it impacted their daily lives. Um, and then Martha, so we they, they had the cameras for about uh, a month. Then Martha um uh, went back to them individually and with them curated um top three to five images for each person and then uh, they were displayed at an at, uh, at an exhibition with local decision makers and uh, local um, ngos so what i want to do now is just present to you uh, a very few uh, images from the project so this is in in gola 
the Gola district, which experiences floods and droughts. And on the left, you see images that relate um, more with um, with uh, difficult water access and water quality issues in health. So on the top left, you see a woman bathing right under a bridge, and the water there is. Uh, um, reflects from uh, from uh, a factory, so unclean water. At the bottom, you see a woman refilling her jerry can uh, from an unsafe water source. And then on the right, the two right images relate to flooding issues. So on top, um, this is uh, uh, representing a family that has been, uh, that lost their homes due to flooding issues, and they had to build this temporary shelter where, where they currently live. Um, and on the bottom right, we see um, an image of infrastructure being damaged by flooding. Um, then moving on to Harukersa, the, the other um, sub-district on the top left, we see women uh, fetching uh, water. And Harukesa has a has a hilly part to it. So here they're in the hills trying to collect water from these from these uh, uh, natural uh, water basins. And you can see that the, the water, because it's stagnant, is, is of poor quality. On the bottom left, um, this is documenting the impact on cattle. So this is cattle drinking water that has been contaminated by, by a factory. And this has been causing a lot of um, um, a death and illnesses amongst cattle in the community. On the top right, one of the reasons why I like this photo is that when we think about water in Ethiopia, there's often this very stereotypical image of a woman um, at a hand pump collecting water in a yellow, yellow, yellow jerry can. And in general, lots of images around women and water. And I think that is it, it makes sense because women are primarily responsible for water. But at the same time, men also have a role, and here we can see them uh, taking the, uh, the the cattle to drink um, to drink water. And we collected a number of really uh, evocative images and and quite beautiful images um, that we would not have captured if it was just me behind the camera. And then on the bottom right, um, this is also an important image for this project. So this is, um, as I mentioned, Harukesa, a very dry sub-district. And what the community does uh, during the, the summer month, or the, sorry, the, during the dry season when there's very poor, very little rain, is that they often migrate for many weeks um, near a, a river called, this is the Boga River. It takes them many, many days to get there and then they settle there during the, the driest month so they have um, access to water. And again, this is not something that we would have been able to capture. Um, we did hear through interviews when we first came to the area that they migrated, but it's not an area that we would, would have been able to access. So participatory photography really gives you, um, provide access to different places. You obviously have more time and it's very much grounded on the, the, you know, the local knowledge and the local understanding. So this is an image of the participant. Uh, their photos were exhibited. This was in uh, in September this year, um, and there was a an exhibition in in the local air in the in the in Mitahara town, um, which also gathered local decision makers and NGOs. And so this was an opportunity for the participants to share their stories through images, but they also were given a microphone and they were also sharing their stories. And there was a dialogue between the the decision makers and. Um, and the, the participants. This is not all the participants. I think there's a few missing, but this is a, a few of them. Um, so this is Halima sharing uh, sharing her story. And just to wrap up, um, some of the learnings from from this project. Um, well, there's there's a few different learnings we can take away. Uh, one from the decision makers end, and we actually asked the decision makers to fill forms about their understanding of um, what are security issues in the area before and after the event. And so we're still sort of processing all those um, reports, but 
overall, we can say that there is an increased understanding of local issues. For example, one of the decision makers reported that uh, they were planning on building a type of borehole, um, the same type of borehole or get across the whole area, but understanding the different uh, the diversity of different types of issues in different sub districts made him more aware um, that that technology had to be different in those different areas. From the uh, participant perspective, they reported an increased understanding of local decision making processes. So who does what, um, how they take decisions, but also some of the limitations they're facing. I, I will also say, and, and the last point is not based on uh, something that's been reported, but this is more something that, that we've been thinking about, is that the participants dedicated a lot of time and energy to this project. Um, and they probably have much higher expectation um, that something will happen. And unfortunately, um, we can't say for sure that, well, we can say that this an increased understanding of these local issues, but we can't say for sure whether the decision makers will uh, take action, will, will make improvements. And so this could potentially create some tensions in the sense that there is a higher expectations from the community perspective. Um, and I think, I think it is worth exploring this uh, further. From a photography perspective, um, I think what I took away is that some of the photos were maybe, I mean, maybe not even, but maybe some of them were, were less aesthetic than, you know, professional um, photographers, but actually you get a wider diversity of issues and experiences represented. And that's really important. The photos are more authentic and we know that oftentimes, um, oftentimes that's more effective at communicating certain issues it makes it more relatable it makes it more real in a sense uh, if it's you know if, if it's an image that looks too aesthetic then it might not look as real um, so this was an important point there's a quote by Ingrid Sishi who says that beauty uh, is a call to admiration and not necessarily a call to action and I think this is a, a, an important point for photographers out there um, as I mentioned, with participatory photography, you allow more time, um, you have a wider geography covered, and obviously uh, um, the community members are the authors of, of their photographs. And so they, they, they become active participants rather than just passive subjects. And I think from a community empowerment, this is a very important point. But again, um, you know, these projects, are. Um, funded for short periods of time and so what next is a real question and i think we have to be honest about the fact that um you know as researchers we don't know if if it will actually uh, translate into concrete improvement for the community. Um, there are many challenges, many barriers, not least of them is the fact that Ethiopia is now uh, heading into um, a, a civil conflict. Um, and so those are all issues that remain. Measuring the long term impact is, is very difficult and, and tricky. So um, my final takeaways of these different projects, uh, one is on the, the power and the value of photography as a tool for, for research, uh, for communication, as well as community engagement. I think it's, there's, there's really something there um, to, to engage with. And, 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 you know, photography projects are flourishing everywhere. But even, um, I think, exploring this aspect of community engagement is is very powerful and photography is powerful in a positive way but it can be it can be um powerful in a harmful way so i think engaging with the ethics of photography um is is really critical for photographers but also for curators for commissioners as well as communicators in general we all have a role um, um in in this space and again measuring the long-term impacts is something that is that can be quite difficult to do uh, measuring the the actual impacts on the ground but also the impacts on um uh, on changing narratives i think this is something that takes a lot of time we know that sometimes one image can have an impact but most of the time one image or a few images on their own won't drastically change a narrative it takes time and this is very difficult to measure um, so just a final thing to say is that over the past year and a half, two years, I've been very interested in this 
um, in this idea or this this theme of photography ethics um, and research ethics in general. So my colleague uh, Catherine and I have been running this um, this series around uh, development and photography ethics. They run once a month. Um, these are just a few of the titles to give you a flavor, uh, but I can share a link if you're interested or you can you can email me and we've had some really fantastic speakers. Um, we're actually we'll be taking a little break because I'm, I'm about to head on uh, to maternity leave, um, but uh, this is something I, I certainly want to investigate further. So if any of you have um, experiences with with these themes with these topics I'm, I'd be very keen to hear. Uh, to hear from you and to hear your experiences and especially how this manifests itself in in, um, in the museum context. So thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, this is it for.